Uh, my name is Lisa Gerhard. I'm in the data AI and analytics group here at NERSC. Um, and I'll be talking to you about data storage and sharing best practices. Um, so first I'm going to start um, talking about some best practices around storing data at NERSC. Um, and I just want to touch really quickly on our um, data storage policy. This is sort of what you are and aren't allowed to do with data and kind of where, where the rights are and what, what things are how things are set up. Um, so we give users the means to store, manage, and share the research data projects, products that are generated, most of which are generated at NERSC. Um, these resources are intended for users with active allocations. If your project isn't active at NERSC anymore, it's strongly recommended that you transfer your data somewhere that you're going to continue to have access. Um, we can't guarantee that you'll be able to get to your data, you know, if you come back a few years from now. So you need to take stewardship of that and move it somewhere else. Um, project PIs can request the modification, deletion, or transfer to another NERSC file system of any data associated with their NERSC award, regardless of who owns it on the file system. Um, and when you're working with files on the on the file system, they're protected using Unix file permissions um, based on information provided by IRIS and, and group IDs. Um, so it's ultimately the user's responsibility to make sure that file permissions and various um, preset settings like UMasks you have are set to match the level of sharing that you want to have with your data. Um, and finally, users are ultimately responsible for managing and backing up their data. Um, and we have a much many more words about this um, on our data policy page. So if you have any questions, I encourage you to take a look there. Um, so that's sort of the policy around the file systems. Now let me talk to you about the file systems themselves. So we have um, several different layers of file systems um, and they each have different levels of performance and capacity. Um, so to, in order to have really high performance, um, it, it's, it costs a lot of money. And so it's very hard to have a lot of capacity if you have very high performance. Um, so you, know, you can kind of see this sort of um, as you move down this tree, performance increases, but capacity increases. Performance decreases, but capacity increases. So kind of at the top level, you have memory. If you're able to stream directly to memory and work with data in there and your data is small enough to fit in there, that's always going to be the fastest performance. Um, next step below that is our Perlmutter Scratch file system. Um, we have about 36 petabytes right now of active space. Um, it's very fast when you're working with it on our computes. Um, the next layer below that is our community file system. Um, that's a GPFS system. Um, it has 115 petabytes. Um, it's mostly intended for sharing data within groups um, and so storing data that's not actively being used. Um, and then after that, we have a tape archive system. We either call it archive or HPSS. Um, right now, it's, it's in excess of 300 petabytes. Um, it grows quite a bit every year. Um, that's for long-term storage. And then we have two sort of uh, auxiliary systems, um, Global Common and Homes, um, which you've ha each have sort of dedicated usage. So that's sort of the global tour of these things. I'm gonna, now I'm gonna talk a little bit more each, about each one in depth. So um, starting with Perlmutter Scratch, um, this, is, this is Lustre, um, which is a particular kind of file system that's been um, on HPC systems for a long, long time. It's very successful and, mat and mature. It's very good at performing at high concurrency, uh, high speeds. Um, and this is where you want to store your data that's being actively read or written by jobs on computes. This is where you're going to get the best performance. If you have a lot of IO, you want to do it out of the Scratch directory. Um, we create the directories on there. They're user readable and writable by default. That is, the ownership of the directory is at the user level. So every user gets a directory on Scratch, um, and they get a default quota of 20 terabytes. Um, where you can store your data. Um, because capacity on Scratch is limited, um, what we do is, and it's intended for active use only, uh, we have an automatic purging um, mechanism that will go through and delete files that haven't been accessed um, within a certain amount of time. So it's not a permanent place you can keep your data. So you need to back up any important data that's that you put on Scratch. So basically you put it on Scratch, run your computing, and then move it off to some other longer term storage. Uh, so um, there's some ways you can optimize your performance on Scratch. Um, for the most of the IO 
that's going on at NERSC, um, the, the default that we have is sufficient. Um, so if you're doing sort of small file or each one of, or you have a single process that's reading one file, um, the default striping across one um, background IO server is enough. Um, but if you're doing some kind of IO where you, you have um, many processes accessing a single file, um, you wanna set it up so that that file is shared across all of the backend um, IO servers that are in our Lester system, because otherwise all of your processes will be jammed up trying to talk to this one IO server. Um, and so these are things you can set ahead of time before you run your job. Um, we have a whole page on how to set up the scratch, uh, the striping. And we have several helper, sort of what we call helper scripts where you can set up the default striping for your file, depending on the size of it. Um, and we have a little, like, I've, I've just copied the little table that's on our site that sort of gives you an idea. You know, if you're dealing with a really, you know, small one to 10 gigabytes, you want to stripe, you don't need to stripe as widely. If it, as it gets larger, you need to involve, involve more servers. Um, <clears throat> and you can manually query what the striping is by using LFS get stripe and then the path to the file. Um, and you can also set this as a default for a directory. Like if you have a directory where you're going to have a, you're going to put a bunch of really large files and you don't want to set up the striping for each one, you can set that on the directory. New files that you put in there or files that you copy in there will inherit that striping. So if you're doing <clears throat> single shared file IO or you're working with really big files, um, you need to think about file striping and, and check out our docs there. Um, but if you're working with very small, with smaller files, less than a gigabyte or so, um, and you're doing file per process, you should be fine with the defaults. Um, so the next thing that I want to talk about is one of our, um, what we call sort of auxiliary file systems. This is Global Common. Um, and this, what this file system is for, is for installing software stacks. So let's say you have a really large, um, uh, you know, your, your application has lots of dependencies and needs a lot of things you have to install yourself, um, a lot of libraries you have to load. Um, or if you're installing software for your whole group and you want to share it with people, um, you want to put it in Global Common. Um, and the reason why you want to do this is because at scale on the system, Global Common is, is one of the better, the best file systems for delivering a software stack. Um, so if you, you will get performance, best performance if you use a container, but if you don't want to use that, then you should put your software in Global Common. Um, and Global Common has a different setup where each project gets a directory in there. Um, and so if you want to install your, your software in Global Common, you can navigate to Global Common Software, the name of your project, and then you should be able to create a subdirectory in there and write your, your software in there as needed. Uh, we also have the community file system. Um, so this is this is our largest capacity spinning disk file system. Um, and this is for di large data sets that you need for a longer period. Like if you think you're going to be accessing this data set in the next couple of months or within this year, um, you probably want to keep it on, on community file system. We often call it CFS because it's a pretty big mouthful um, to say community file system. Uh, but it's not for intensive IO. It's, it's for capacity and for sharing data. Um, if you're doing a lot of IO, you should use Scratch instead. Um, there's, it's also mounted in a special way on our computes. And I'll get into that a little bit more in, in the next couple of slides. Um, so on the community file system and on the global common file system, data is never purged. Um, and we have this functionality called snapshots where um, every day for the last week, um, we take a snapshot, a picture of the every file that's on the file system. Um, and so if you are working and you delete a file that you worked on all day yesterday, you don't have to recreate it from scratch. You can go into the snapshots and get the one from yesterday and at least get the last day's work back. Um, so the usage on this is managed by quotas um, and projects can split their space allocations between multiple directories um, and give each separate working group a, a separate quota. So if you have someone who's doing, I don't know, some kind of simulation development, some kind of experiment, you could make a separate directory for each of those, split your total quota between them um, and allocate that as you, as you need. Um, there's also an environment variable CFS that, that gives you a little helper to fill out the path. Um, and you can find some more details here on our webpage about community file system. Um, so our HPSS tape archive is kind of the largest capacity tier that we have. Um, and it's for basically for long-term data retention. You know, let's say you've gotten your paper published and accepted and you don't think you're gonna need this data anymore. You can 
but you might. So you put it into HPSS. Um, raw data, you might need in case of, an, of emergency. Any really hard to generate data, um, anything that you want to keep a backup of that you think you might have to need to bring back out, um, but you're not going to access frequently, you should go into HPSS. Um, so the thing to keep in mind about HPSS is that it's a tape system at its heart. There is a spinning disk cache in front of it. So data will go in really quickly. Um, and it, it feels just like you're writing to an actual file system. But behind the scenes, that data, if it's not accessed, gets migrated off um, to one of the tens of thousands of tapes in our tape archive. Um, so later, if we come back a year later and you're trying to get that data off, it might be spread across many hundreds of tapes, depending on the size. Um, so we generally recommend that if you have like a group of data that you think you're going to need to want to bring back all at once, um, you use a, a special bundling archive, special bundling application called HTAR um, to, to move these things into bundles. And you want to aim for sizes of 100 gigabytes to 2 terabytes. Um, and when you are backing up your data, um, you should think about the situation in which you'd want to retrieve the data. So, you know, you may not necessarily want to preserve the directory structure you have on spinning disk. If you don't think you're going to need that, maybe you would want to put, if you have a bunch of calibration files, you think you're going to need them all together, maybe you'd put those together into a bundle. Um, so just think for a little bit about how you might be retrieving the data and then try and uh, put it into HPSS in, in that way. Um, <clears throat> if you're inside of NERSC and trying to put data into HPSS, there's two, um, two ways to do it. It's HSI and HTAR, um, and those give the best performance within NERSC. Those are the tools we recommend that you use. So HSI puts individual files, HTAR makes a bundle and puts it directly into HPSS. Um, there is also a quota system for HPSS, um, and they're controlled via IRIS. Um, so if you are in multiple projects and you're putting data into HPSS, you can go into IRIS and say what portion of quota you want uh, attributed to which project. Um, and there's a lot more details about how to use HPSS on our webpage. Um, and finally, home directories. Um, this is the place you end up, you, you land in when you first log into the system. Um, and uh, it's basically for um, just for a little bit of sandbox experimentation kind of stuff. It's for source files, small source files, scripts for testing, like you when you're first making things, notes, um, configuration files, like to set up your dot files and things like that. Um, it's got a very small quota because we think most of your work should be on these other file systems. Um, it's not intended for intensive IO, um, so you should use Scratch or Global Common or if you need to share with your collaborators CFS um, uh, instead. Uh, so it's backed up monthly by HP into our tape archive. And there's also snapshots on our home directories if you accidentally delete something out of there. So that's the, the that's sort of the file systems that are available at NERSC. I just want to give some general advice for how you could do so best do IO. Um, so I think I've mentioned this several times already that IO from batch jobs should go to Perlmutter Scratch file system. Um, this includes things like input data for your jobs, configuration files. Uh, if you're writing output data, you're, you're, it's best to go to Scratch. So anything that's being read in or read out by your jobs should put it on Perlmutter Scratch. Um, software for your jobs. Um, if you have a lot of it and you really want to be have really good performance, really low startup times and fast accesses, um, you should put it in a container. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then you should use Global Common. Um, this includes things like Conda environments. So if you're doing a Conda install um, and you're going to run this at scale, that should go into Global Common. Um, and then generally anything else you're doing, config, make, make, see, make, all of that stuff, um, you know, once you get it up and working, um, should go into Global Common. Just in general, across all file systems, um, they don't do well if you have many, many, many small files. Um, they especially don't do well if you have many, 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 many files in one directory. You'll find delays in listing, delays in accessing um, if you have many small files. So try to avoid doing that. Um, and then when you're doing general I.O. from your applications, it's always better to aggregate reads and writes into bigger pieces if you can. Um, so now I want to talk about something that's special that's just at NERSC, which is called DVS. It's called, it's a data, it stands for Data Virtualization Service. 
Um, and it's an IO forwarder um, and we've had it NERSC um, for many years. Um, and what it does is it lets us offer um, our file systems at scale um, when they're not specifically wired up for that. Um, so um, there's a set of 24 nodes in our system that mount the, the file systems like uh, CFS and Global Common. Um, and then they, they have they leverage caching and good network performance and, and the IO forwarding to be able to serve all of our compute nodes for this file, for these file systems. Um, so we have two types of mounts. Um, and when you're on a compute um, node, you're gonna see this, two types of mounts, one of which is read only um, and one is read write, and these behave differently. Um, so if, it, if, we, if you're accessing something with a read only mount, um, that file is actually served by all 24 of those IO forwarders. Each one is going to push a little piece and it has really aggressive caching. So if you've already accessed that file, um, it's going to be on the DVS nodes and you don't need to go all the way back to the file system and read it again. Um, if you're using a read write mount, um, that file goes through one DVS server and that server that's going to handle that file is determined when the file is created. So it never is always going to be talking to that server. Um, and there's a very small cache. So almost always, if you're going to access that file over the read write mount, it's gonna go back to the file system and get the data. So um, the reason why you guys, you need to know about this is that CFS, Global Commons and Homes are all mounted via DBS on the compute nodes. So if you're using them at scale, you're gonna need to do some special things I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. Um, but before I do, I just want to say that keep in mind that scale means multiple concurrent jobs. So if you write a code that's a single node job and then you submit, you know, a thousand of them and a hundred of them start up at once, that's a large scale job because those are a hundred nodes doing this access, even though each node, each job is separate. So it's something to keep in mind when you're making your workloads. <clears throat> So um, this is part of the reason why we um, advocate for software environments to go onto Global Common. Global Common is mounted read only on the computes. So when you're trying to access the software there, you're gonna have leverage all 24 of the DBS nodes. Um, that means you're gonna get your data that much faster. If you don't, if you put your Conda environment on homes and you go and mount you know, the, the thousands to tens of thousands of um, directory paths that you need to search for your Conda environment, it's all going to go through one DVS server. And that's going to cause a huge bottleneck, especially if you have, you know, 10, 100 nodes doing this. Um, <clears throat> and so you need to, if you're going to be running at scale at all above, I would say maybe five or 10 nodes, and you're using Conda environments, it needs to go on global common or in a container. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that um, I know that a lot of folks like to like put in their dot files to load a, a Conda configuration at login, um, which can be really convenient because you're in the environment that you're already in, it's there. Um, but when you submit a batch job, even if you're not invoking that Conda environment, that since that's in your environment already, it's gonna get dragged along with that batch job um, and it'll get included in the LD library path, everything will get searched. Um, so you need to be uh, cognizant of the environment from which you're submitting. Um, and consider whether or not you want this Conda environment that's in your login node involved with any jobs that you submit. Um, another place where folks can add, run into problems around Python is that um, when Python automatically adds the current working directory to the library load path that it searches. So you could do everything right. You could put your, your Conda environment in global common, your data in scratch. And then if you submit from CFS for Python, it's going to um, get DVS involved in that way. So it's just something to think about. Um, there's a flag you can add in Python to turn this off. I'm not really sure um, why they decided to do it by default, but I think it's, um, it, it's a way that you can do a perfectly normal activity and get into some trouble on the system. Um, and then again, uh, if you're, during large scale IO, you always want to use Scratch, um, but some experiments have really large data pools, um, much larger than their Scratch allocation. Some of them have hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, and so, and they don't know what data they're going to need ahead of time. Um, so it's very difficult to stage just the things you're going to use to, to, to Scratch. Um, so some of those folks choose to use, to read it off of CFS. 
If you're going to do that, we actually have a special dedicated mount of CFS that's mounted read-only that will give you a lot of the performance benefits. Um, and so if you are reading data off of CFS, um, you should amend your path um, and replace the global with DBS RO, and then everything else is the same, and you'll get the benefits of this, this read-only mount. Um, and then one last thing to keep um, keep an eye on is some some groups like to use ACLs, which are like extra file permissions to manage who can see what data. Um, and if you're using that over DBS, um, it's going to not make the caching work um, and you'll see decreased performance. So in general, um, just avoid using those if you if you can. OK, so I'm just going to talk really quickly about data management tools. Um, so uh, the community file system is a shared space. Um, and depending on how many people are in your collaboration, you can run into situations where you'll be at your quota and you don't know which one of your collaborators is using it. Um, so we have this thing called data dashboard. You can go to my.nurse.gov my and click on data dashboard. And it'll show you um, for all of the directories on CFS, um, where you are in the quota and you can click on this toggle usage details and you can see who's using the most quota on this file system, you know, and, and who's got what where. Um, and so then you can sort of say, you know, oh my gosh, I really need to clean up because I'm pretty high up there or, you know, reach out to the folks who are filling up the file system. Um, and here's an example here. Um, you can click this toggle usage details. You can see, you know, this directory is pretty full and this user, um, we need to ask them if maybe they could clean up a little bit. Um, and then you can adjust the quotas for the community file system in Iris. Um, this is an example. You just go for your group and you navigate to the storage plane. And then you can see there's you can you can see the total quota allocated to your project, which in this case is 200 terabytes. Um, and then you can take this quota and distribute it across however many directories you have associated with your project. And PIs and PI proxies can come in here and move these numbers around as needed. Um, and then we also have this thing called the PI toolbox. So if you're a PI or a PI proxy and um, you need to adjust permissions in the community file system, which happens a lot, um, folks put data in, but they don't realize they haven't set the file permissions so that they can be shared. You can actually come in here and navigate to that directory and say, hey, I want you to make this directory readable to everybody. And it'll go through and run it in the background. Um, and then everyone can read it. Uh, so now we're going on to talk about how best to share data. Um, so I think it, there's two different kinds of sharing. There's first, there's sharing inside of, I'll talk first about sharing inside of NERSC, and then later I'll talk about sharing with people outside of NERSC. But if you're inside of NERSC, um, the community file system is intended for sharing data with the project. Um, so you can, Put your, if you want to share with other people in your, your NERSC project, you can put this data in that, that directory. Um, and by default, it's set up so that everyone can write there and everyone can read there. It's a great way to make um, data accessible to your entire group. Um, and I talked earlier about how you can manage permissions in case there's some drift. Um, that's, that's something that you can do pretty easily with that. Um, we also have a similar set of, of project directories in HPSS. Um, where you, you have a similar structure, you can have a whole a project readable and writable directory in HPSS, which the whole group can use to archive um, if you have shared data that you need to put away. <clears throat> we also have a construct known as a collaboration account. Um, and this is it's like an account that's tied to a group instead of an individual user. Um, and you can, the, the project PI can say who in the group has access to the collaboration account. Um, and then you can do a special process to become this collaboration account, and then you can read and write data as that account on the system. And that's really useful for things like shared data sets, um, or if you're running shared workloads or doing software installs for the whole project. That way you don't have to, like if someone graduates or, you know, you don't have to go through and um, make the ownership change over. You can just remove them from this collaboration account, add in a new person, um, and everyone can work together on this um, uh, and then you can also share inside of your Scratch directory. I mean, by default, the Scratch directories are readable and writable only by you, um, but you can just use the Linux um, file system permissions to make them group readable. Uh, and I just put an example in here of how you can do that. Um, 
And then if you have someone outside of your project who you want to give some share some files with, we have something called give and take. Um, and this is a mechanism to give um, small single files to any other nurse user. And so you just say give file name and it'll actually send an email and, uh, to the user that you specify that says, hey, someone gave you a file, come on to the nurse system and say take and you can get this file. So it's a quick way to pass data around. Um, if you have external collaborators that you need to share data with, um, we have um, some uh, with this public HTML access um, where you can, <clears throat> every directory, if you, every project directory if you, has a, if you create a dub 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 directory in there, it's automatically made public under this URL. Um, and so that's a, sort of a quick way that you can share data, um, small amounts of data um, with external collaborators. You can drop it in there and they can come and just pull it down via the web. Uh, we also, if you want more sophisticated um, portals. We have uh, something called Science Gateways, um, where you can set up really, um, lots of groups have set up really, really nice um, portals that can be used to share data with lots of really great interfaces. Um, and these, most of these are done via SPIN, which I think is covered in another top. Um, and then there's also Globus sharing. Um, so what you can do is you can set up a read-only endpoint for sharing data um, with a, a data movement tool called Globus. Um, and this is an excellent way to share large volumes of data because you can actually incorporate it directly into web pages. Um, we have a set of data, <clears throat> dedicated data transfer nodes. Um, we often call them DTNs. Um, these are servers that are intended just for moving data in and out of NERSC. Um, they have really high bandwidth network interfaces. Everything's tuned for very efficient transfers. Um, and we partner with um, ESNet and with other DOE labs to make sure that we have super high speed transfers um, going between them. And it has direct access to community file system in the HPSS archive. Um, when Corey was up, it had access to the scratch, but since Corey's not around, we don't have that anymore. Um, so if you're trying to move large volumes of data in and out of NERSC or between NERSC systems, you should use the DTNs. Um, if you're trying to add, write to Perlmutter Scratch, you should use the Perlmutter login nodes. Um, and for transferring data, um, we recommend a program called Globus. Um, this is the main tool for moving data in and out and even within NERSC if you want. Um, it's really reliable. It's very easy to use. It's got a nice web interface. You can just go and drag and drop your files from one to the other, and it'll take care of the whole movement, high-speed parallel transfer in the background. It retries automatically if things don't succeed, uh, and you'll get an email notification of success or failure, and you can actually, there's like a dashboard where you can track your transfers. Um, it's really very nice and takes a lot of the pain of data movement out of, out of the way for users. Um, so we have multiple endpoints that we manage. Um, and you can also, if you need to, we have, there's a command line script um, you can use to access things um, and an, an REST API you can connect. And if you are trying to, to move data to someone who doesn't have Globus on their end, um, Globus has a something called Globus Connect Personal that you can install on your laptop that you can use to, to pull the data down. And we have a lot more details on our webpage. Um, so if you're transferring data, um, we recommend for large transfers, you use Globus. Um, and this is not just for external stuff. If you have a, you know, a couple terabytes of data, you need to move off of Perlmutter Scratch onto CFS. Um, you can use Globus for that too. And it's going to be just as performant and probably easier than doing it yourself. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you would transfer into HPSS, um, via Globus, um, and if you have smaller one-time transfers, like a couple hundred megabytes or something, you can use SCP. Um, Globus is also fine for that too. Um, so it's whatever you find easiest to use. Um, the only thing that we ask is that you don't use the data transfer nodes for non-data transfer purposes. Um, if you are doing compiling or other things like that, that's what the system login nodes are for. Data transfer nodes are for processes that are moving um, data between the center. Uh, when you're doing large-scale transfers, uh, the limit is often the remote endpoint. Um, you can get from, like, uh, most of the time when folks have trouble, things go okay from university to university, uh, but then it's that last mile down to your computer that, that has some problems. Um, so um, you may sometimes see file system contention. Um, 
you could try it a different time or a different file system. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's usually um, network contention. Um, don't, yeah, don't transfer directly to your home. You're going to hit the quota right away and it's going to be slow. Um, if you're running a big, large scale transfer and you're not getting the rates you expect, um, feel free to open a ticket and we'll help you debug what's going wrong. Uh, so I just wanted to talk for a minute about transferring to NERCs, the HPSS via Globus. Um, so if you uh, have a bunch of data that you want to put into HPSS, you can use the DTNs for that. Um, that's part of what they're for. Um, but we also have a special transfer queue, X for queue, on Perlmutter that you can use. That'll be long lived. Um, and you can use HSI to sort of put or get individual files. Um, and you can use HTAR to, to bundle a bunch of files together. Um, uh, we also have a Globus command line tool for if you're coming in from somewhere else and want to go transfer into HPSS. Um, or you're trying to pull out of HPSS and go over Globus. And it has some nice things where it'll do, um, make sure that it's sorted and tape order so there's not too many retrievals and things like that. Um, so uh, you, you generally wanna use the Globus command line tools to pull out of HPSS for um, if you're pulling a small number of large files. We have some more details about how to optimize, how to optimize this on our webpage. Um, so just to conclude, NERSC has multiple file systems and they all fulfill a different performance or capacity need. Uh, there's lots of different ways to transfer and share data. Um, you know, we've got a lot of documentation up on our site. And if you have a question that wasn't answered here, feel free to open a ticket and we'll help you out. Thank you.